Every addiction starts with a soft choice. It's a, it's a quiet compromise. What's the harm? Not hurting anybody. But very few things are as they appear. I guess I'm here today to communicate that there is an alternative to the pervasive view that this is harmless and, and this is just the way it is uh, and that, that there's no way out that we are just as a as a nation supposed to just continue to approve the endless destruction of moral boundaries that we're just supposed to sit back and say yeah that's fine as marriages continue to fall apart as people continue to be consumed by addictive life that we've, we've got to do something about that if coming to a camera and being candid and saying this is what god's done in my life uh, this, the plan of this was to, was to destroy me and my marriage and our future, and, and God's turned all that around. Pornography is the graphic, explicit uh, depiction of, of sex, and it's, it's meant to stimulate and to, and to, uh, to arouse. Pornography is images, sexual images, that robs people of intimacy of joy that paints a false picture of what and who women are. Emotionally, when a man looks at pornography, he feels alive. That woman on the image is saying, I want you, you're wonderful, you're incredible. The reason why pornography is the most addictive thing in the universe is that it allows a man to feel like a man without requiring him to be one. It's a fantasy, it's, it's fake, it's not real, and it hollows you out. Anything that has life, uh, it, life is stripped from it when it comes in contact with, with pornography. We're created as men and women to enjoy the gift of sex and the gift of sexuality within a sacred covenantal relationship and whenever we step outside of those boundaries there's going to be a diminishment to our own souls and so really it, it diminishes it, it it lessens our capacity to love and to be human it infects every group every culture every um, ethnicity uh, it it does not discriminate in any way and pornography is just that powerful that it is able to break into um, any group. It's the kids from little suburban white America. It's the kids from the hood in, you know, down in the ghetto. It's, it's, it's kids from, uh, you know, it's immigrant families. It's, it's, it's everybody. It's, people are being uh, impacted by it. Pornography kills. Pornography destroys. Pornography strips uh, men and women of their dignity. Um, Pornography violates love. It prevents intimacy, and that's, that's the case in my life. first exposure to pornography was 10, 11 years old. Uh, a neighbor 
I guess it was a neighbor, had left these out. We lived in a small community and left them out in a barn, big stack of them in the, in the barn. And I found those out in the middle of nowhere. And that was the beginning. I remember the impact of that on my whole psyche and this fascination with this world that no one was talking about, but obviously was going on. In high school, I remember being with a friend on a trip to a summer sports camp, and that friend stole, actually shoplifted, a penthouse magazine, and, and, and it felt like gold. It felt like this person had just lifted the hope diamond out of that store, and we were carrying around the most valuable possession that we had. What happened was that pornography started to feed and nurture my heart, my emotions, and I could not live without it. My journey into darkness and secrecy really began um, when I started my own business and um, I had my office in my home and um, we had a computer and uh, I remember just being curious, uh, typing in keywords uh, just to see what would come up and um, it didn't take long, you know, to where there were some pretty graphic and explicit images, you know, right there before my eyes. And uh, I was just, I mean, it just, it just captivated me. I live with a tremendous sense of paranoia. I just knew that someone was going to see me. Someone was going to, someone was going to see the pastor going into this adult bookstore. And and so I, was, I always looked over my shoulder. I was always afraid. I always kind of walked, I always lived my life with a sense of um, uh, uneasiness. There was no peace there because I always felt like somebody's going somebody's gonna to find out and then my story's going to be out. Um, and I just continued this, this kind of pattern, this hidden secret. My wife didn't know. No one knew my, my deep, dark secret. Never in my wildest dreams did I or could I imagine that, um, that years later, 20 years later, 25 years later, that I would be engaged in all kinds of sexual acting out that I did not want to do. And not only for religious reasons, because I, I grew up in a home that was nominally Christian, and uh, God was someone who I was really afraid of, and I didn't have any beliefs per se that, uh, that this was wrong. It was just that it felt shameful to me. And somewhere deep inside of my own heart, I, I had this shame and this anxiety and this dread that if anybody ever found out about this, that there's no way that I could live through that, that there's no way that I could be loved or accepted or wanted based on the things that I thought about and the things that I did. And even as I went to seminary, where I thought, seminary, there's no way. I'll be able to stay away from the pornography in seminary. Uh, they'll have the internet service will be filtered. It'll be, you know, this is seminary. There's no way. But in reality, it wasn't that way. Um, in fact, at seminary is where the, the, the addiction really began to take root. It, it, that's really where it became the darkest uh, in the, in the, during those years at seminary. Playing the part, going to church every Sunday morning, sitting up in that choir loft, singing those songs, listening to those sermons, teaching that Sunday school class. But in the back of my mind, I was filled with guilt. And it just became, it became overwhelming. I, I was tired of living a lie. There was no, there was no peace. I had no rest. I was living a double life. If you had looked in on my life, you would have said everything was working. We had the right cars, the, the right home, beautiful family. You'd see us at church on a regular basis. You, you could have said, hey, this is working. But the reality was that behind the scenes, I had already begun uh, a departure from that. And once I had begun, I, there, was, there was no coming back because of the secrecy of it. And it began to grow, it began to grow. And as a result of that growing, the job was affected, uh, home life was affected, my self-respect was affected, 
the dignity was affected, all those things began to impact our life. Came away from seminary, still holding the secret, still realizing that, that I'm internally, I'm really still in crisis over this thing. It's really, there's a, there's a darkness to me, but no one knew, and I didn't want anybody to know, so I go back out into ministry and serving as a pastor, and the addiction really begins to emerge stronger. Um, I had resisted and, and just wanted to change, but I, the change wasn't happening. You know, I'm like, God, can you just take this thing away from me? Just take it away. I'll do whatever. I'll do whatever. sets an impossible appetite and an impossible standard and it, it steals from the true beauty of what marriage is supposed to be. You know, it's the perfect theft of growing old together. Who wants to grow old together in, in a culture where all we honor is what's young? When, when what we're supposed to really want and desire is, you know, this perfect thing over here physically and we miss the whole point of marriage. No. What women want most of all, and it's the dichotomy of, of the industry, is that women want to be beautiful and desired by the man that they love. A and it gets twisted and in, in, the, in the industry, and the women are portrayed as, I want you, and I've got to have you, and so the men are, are attracted to that. but. What that woman behind the camera really wants is unconditional love and for one man to say, I love you and you're beautiful and I accept you and, and, uh, and she's hurting just like the men that are addicted to it are hurting. She's in a prison as well. For me being a Christian, and struggling with pornography. It was extremely difficult in that there was an enormous amount of guilt. And that guilt was driving me away from every relationship that mattered in my life. First, number one, was my relationship with God. Number two, was my relationship with my wife. Number three, my kids and my friends. The guilt had caused me to with, withdraw from those relationships. It affected us in a, in a very deep way. It affected the way she saw herself, it affected the way that I saw her, it affected, definitely affected the way I saw myself. When you, when you know your behavior is contrary to your belief system and to your to the God that you know uh, at some point that conflict demands a resolution one way or the other you're either going to give in and go for it and sacrifice everything for the pixels on the screen because that's all it is when you shut the power off it's gone or you make a commitment to what's real what's a real human sitting next to you and and commit to whatever it takes to make that work and we had to make that decision together because of the power of the internet and the availability of it there's this whole new breed of folks that that would never uh, and these are not uh, people of all ages they would never drive to a bookstore across town in a seedy part of town and risk going into uh, a bookstore uh, pastors, Christian leaders, ministers, school teachers, people that would think, hmm, I would, I would never do that. And now it's coming to them, and the anonymity that it affords allows them to, to uh, engage in this behavior that they, they wouldn't otherwise imagine 
that they would ever get addicted to beyond maybe just dabbling in it once or twice. But they do become addicted because of that anonymity. They don't have to put forth the risk and risk being shamed or embarrassed or caught. And then the accessibility is you can get it anywhere. So when you're 12 and 13 and you're not married, you think that when you become married, that this whole habit you've created for yourself will just go away because now you'll have a sex partner. You'll have somebody there that can, whenever that urge comes up, you just, you've got your, you've got your in-house fix, right? But the problem is that the, it's not actually a sexual experience, it's a fantasy experience that, that, that your body gets trained for. So now the reality of the marriage isn't a fantasy. And so you've got this built-in conflict with your, with your marriage partner. If we're talking about a Christian perspective on marriage, then it's incompatible. Yeah, and you've got a habit built into your core personality of whenever life is too much, I escape through, or I escape through, you know, pick the door, whether it's alcohol, whether it is porn, whether it's whatever it is, uh, it's the release valve when I just can't take anymore. Uh, as a believer, follower of Christ, that should be running to God. That should not be running to fantasy. So all I can tell you is my own story. I'm not here to convict you. That's the Holy Spirit's job. I'm not here to, to do a sales job on you and win you to my way of thinking. All I'm trying to do is say this is the life that we lived. And I know I'm not the only one living it because I get the phone calls all the time from guys saying, I'm, I'm coming apart. I, I'm sick of dealing with this. I, I hear it before, during, and after the marriage is falling apart. Young guys coming to me saying, I don't want this in my life because I know God's preparing me for marriage, and I don't want it in my marriage because it goes with you. Whatever we've lived, we bring to the marriage. It didn't go away with the ring and, and, and rice. Suddenly everything's pure and, and we move on. No, the, the life we lived before, we brought in. The number one fear for men with a pornography struggle is that they will be exposed, uh, which is to say another way that they will feel shame, that someone will see me for who I really am. I felt that I would lose absolutely everything. At the time that that friend and mentor and professor asked me that question, have you been unfaithful to your wife? The reason I lied, I knew I'd lose my job. There are pastors that if they go to someone, they're afraid they'll lose their job. There are men who, if they were to share this and it got out, they're afraid their wives would leave them. I was risking so much for pornography. I was risking so much for something so little. I was risking being seen by my children. What if, imagine if my children were to walk in on their dad looking at pornography on the computer. It wasn't until one evening I was, um, we had moved and um, I had my office doors closed and I thought my wife had gone up to bed and she came downstairs and um, opened the door and there it was on the computer screen. And I just, as I think about that night and I, I remember the look on her face. I knew the degree of duplicity I was living. And I just assumed automatically that she would leave because I grew up in a divorced home and it's, it's everywhere. You know, divorce is as common as Starbucks now, so it's just a common procedure for someone to say, I've given up on you. Uh, so I automatically assumed that she'd say that, oh, okay, well, you're a loser. And, I guess at that point in my thinking, I thought I was the only one supporting a multi-billion dollar industry. You know, it's, it's not sane thinking. And so my greatest fear at that time was that I would tell her and she'd say, oh, I can't believe this, you know, which, which she did. But that secondarily she'd say, and also I'm done with you and I'm taking your daughters and I'm walking. And that I was going to be left at this abyss to, to manage myself. 
I think that's why a lot of men don't say anything about it, because they figure they'll be left alone with something they already know is too much. I know that same struggle of, of not wanting to and so desperately not wanting to go there. And that was my life. Um, along the way, my wife had discovered uh, my problem. My secret came out. One night before we were going to bed, she, uh, she, said, uh, she said, hey, I, I discovered something on the computer. Um, I, I discovered this stuff on the computer is pornography. And um, I had nowhere to go. I was, you know, it was me. She wept, she cried. I mean, we were, we were both cried. It was a very painful thing, obviously, for her and, and, and me both. And um, I, I said, yeah, I'm, we're going gonna, gonna to deal with it. I'm, we're going we're gonna to get through this, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with it. But in reality, I, I, I wanted to. I really did, but it wasn't... Um, it didn't change for me there. I was still in bondage to, to pornography, so uh, it, it made it worse because now she would catch me again. And that was probably the most painful thing because um, I'm breaking that trust all over again. I'm, I'm just I'm pouring salt in the wound, so to speak, over and over again. And, and she's just crushed. She had every right to be angry and to be bitter and to be disappointed with me. And she finally came to a point where she is convinced that she needed to leave. She needed to leave me. Our first daughter was born, and I remember looking at her, holding her in my hands and looking at her eyes and realizing there's a transparency in her eyes and her, her spirit that I can't connect to. There's something in me that has shut down. I, I should be able to connect to the degree that she's transparent because those eyes are just, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. If you've, if you've held a baby in your arms, a newborn, it's, there's nothing there but this beautiful transparent soul that God created. It's, oh, wow, and I can't connect. So what's going on in my heart, you know? And uh, so Shelly had gone out of town to see family and I just felt like the Holy Spirit said, this is the day you call her and you tell her, oh God, you know, I can't do that. And I have to be clear that through this whole process, God was faithful to still communicate with me, to still pursue me. It's what he is. He is gracious. He is long-suffering. And, and I guess I had shut him out too. He continued to pursue me. So I thought, well, I just had this sense that if I don't do this today, I'm going to, I'm going to cross that line where there's the, the, the expense of this is going to be exponential. If the destruction is going to be even greater. So. I called her and told her and because she was out of town and I wanted to do it in, in person, but the bomb went off and the truth was out. It took me by complete surprise. I didn't have any clue that it was, was even an issue. I got angry and uh, I got angry at him and at men in general. Pornography strips uh, men and women of their dignity. She finally came to a point where she is convinced that she needed to leave. I remember the look on her face. The bomb went off and the truth was out. I tried to reassure her that it wasn't her, that it had nothing to do with, with her appearance physically. Um, but those, those words just didn't seem to comfort her. This has got to stop. This has got to stop. So I'd always pleaded with God, just take it away. Just do whatever you have to do, but just take it away. This has been 
just so devastating to me and my wife knows and it's it's destroying us it was definitely a death of all that i thought i had and that was real um i felt like i didn't know him anymore and i felt it felt fake everything that we had had prior to that felt artificial and that i was believing a lie that i didn't know him and i didn't know who he really was and um, and the way he felt about me was a big lie. What a man feels as shame, she reads as rejection. So the distance she's talking about is the guy being ashamed, saying, I'm not getting close to you because you're, you're more pure than I am. But what she reads it as is rejection, he doesn't want me. And the guy's heart is crying out, please forgive me. I, I want to be there. I don't want to be alone. I can't take it anymore. And all she's reading is, he's rejecting me. That's the most important thing for women to understand is that um, it's not um, it's not you being rejected. It's not that you're not. It's not because you're not enough, not beautiful, and that he doesn't find you attractive, or it's not because you're not all that he needs or wants. It's it's so important that that women get that, because otherwise, then they're just completely defeated in the fight and makes them want to go run away instead of stand by them. The myth is that you have some control over this thing, and you know. I can, I'm only gonna, I'm only gonna have a drink or two drinks. I'm only gonna look at this this level. I'm, I'm not gonna go over here. But the the reality is that the next thing you know, you're you're further off down the path than you imagined. we have a self-centered demand to have our needs fulfilled apart from God. There is a core element in our flesh, in our fallen selves, of sinfulness that says, I'm not just desiring to be loved. I'm not just desiring for attention, affection, and affirmation as a man. I'm demanding it, and I will get it. And if we don't deal with the wickedness part about how we can justify and demand that our needs be met at the expense of others, that is the core of sin, that we all turn away from God and go our own way. By keeping um, my struggles with pornography a secret, initially we thought we were doing the right thing because nobody was talking about it in the churches. You know, I thought that perhaps I was the only one that was struggling. I'm sure that my wife We've talked and, you know, she was embarrassed. She wondered what people would think, knowing that her husband is struggling with pornography and has been for, for a long time. The most powerful way for God to transform my heart and to change me was for it to be, be known and to be public and to come out and, and, to, and, to, and to cause a major disruption in my life. My way would have been for him to simply take the problem away with pornography and, and not let anyone else find out about it. I didn't know, I didn't realize, as long as this thing lives in secrecy, that's where it thrives.
in this moment where I was so desperate, I continued to hear God whisper to me, tell someone. And so I said, okay, I will tell someone. I will, there's one person I can call, um, and it was actually a pastor friend. And, and I called him up, and um, I said, would you come over uh, to my house? I didn't want to go to his office because I was afraid somebody might see me going to have a private meeting with, with this pastor, and who knows, who knows what they would think. And, and so he came to my house, and he sat in my living room. We were right there, and after a little bit of just chit-chat, I just began to talk about it. I said, this has been my long time battle. This has been my struggle. And he just kind of looked at me and said, you know, I understand. It's, it's, the, it's the struggle that many, many men face. When you expose it, when you start to talk about it, that's when you start to help people. That's when you start to, to offer people accountability. You start to offer them resources. But as long as we continue to to keep the lid on this thing, people are going to sink deeper and deeper and deeper into darkness. Thank God I found my way out. When I said it with my own mouth, when I, when I spoke the story to him, I have just felt such a tremendous relief and, and, a, and, a, and a freedom, literally a freedom came over me that I, I, I can't even, it's hard to describe. I mean, it's hard to even, you know, just, just this, the, the fact that I was able to say it and, and it be out there and to n finally be exposed and, and, to, and to let someone else know. And um, from, that, from that moment on, it's, it has been this, this journey of, of more and more freedom and more and more peace. As you expose the secret, dark sexual sin, it loses its power. I, I believe that sexual sin thrives in darkness and, and grows more powerful in darkness. And, and it, as difficult and as, as um, uh, painful as it is to expose something so personal and so, so deep, it is the, the beginning of, of breaking that, that bondage and that stronghold that, that pornography can often have in a person's life. If you're at the breaking point, then you're going to need help. You're going to need other people around you to say, I'll, I'll help you walk through this. I want to, you know, call me before you're blowing up. Contact me before, the, before you're doing things that you wish you hadn't done. Do this before you activate the shame again in your life, call me. Even if it's just one person. And that's, I had one person that I could call initially. It's the same for women. If you isolate yourself and you don't surround yourself with women, with somebody, and you're dealing with it alone, then, then your resentment festers and your unforgiveness festers and you're just playing it over and over again in your mind because you don't have a release, you don't have anyone to talk to about it. So it's just as important for women to get some sort of support, whether it's another woman or a group or a couple women that you trust. The biblical model is not just accountability, but accessibility. And where accountability crosses into something really powerful to transform us is when you're not a cop in my life, you're not a coach, but you're a cardiologist. And a cardiologist is somebody who's concerned with the welfare of my heart. Jesus said in Matthew 15 that adultery and sexual immorality come out of the heart. It's not what goes into a man that makes him do that. It's what comes out of his heart. And so I need a cardiologist. I need somebody who is going to care for and pursue and probe and be willing to, to make an incision in my heart so that when I come clean, when I open up, um, I'm, I'm not just going to sit there and bleed. I had to count the cost and say, you know what? Maybe I'm the only man in the world, maybe I am, that this has cost years of shame. If I add up the cumulative hours of wasted time, if I add up the years that I wasn't top of my game, opportunities I missed because this tripped me up 
in the middle of opportunity. My head wasn't clear. The only way to freedom is to commit to being free. I remember the day when we understood that and we were able to say together, okay, you know what? Maybe she and I are going to wrestle this the rest of our life. We were going to fight this till, till we leave this. Like Paul said, who will deliver me from this body of death? You know, we've got so many books about making everything better and better and better and plus, 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 you know, and sometimes it's just grueling. Sometimes life is just more than you can take. And that's why we need a savior. That's the message here. So we just decided, you know what? God, you've trusted us with children in the middle of my stupidity and all the stuff that we feel like we're completely failing at. So we're drawing the line. And whatever it takes, the generation that grows up behind us is going to run where we stumble. So we made the decision. I remember the night we did. And we held up our girls in diapers. And I said, this is the end of this. If I'm the only man who stands up in generations and says, I will not take it anymore. Before I had a son to say, yeah, it's worth fighting for. We drew the line and said, you know what? No more. I'm not going to be the man that they look back on. God, if he'd only, you know what? And I'm not doing it all right. I'm not perfect. But if somebody can look back at me and say, yeah, great grandpa John put a flag up while everyone else was out getting trashed and doing whatever they're doing. That great, great grandma Shelley stood up and said, ladies, here's your role in it. That was a decision we made. And that's the decision we live with now. <laughs> you have to go in with a battle mindset. I want to fight this battle. I want to win. This is the decision that I've made that I'm not going to be defiled by by the culture and let it let it let it destroy everything that is so valuable and so so important to me see it, this doesn't happen just because i want it to it doesn't happen just because um, i know that it's bad it happens when i say when i decide i'm going to live differently i'm going to do things differently uh, it is all by God's Spirit that this happens. You can't live differently and not have God be a part of it. Because my natural, my natural way to live would be to, to go and indulge and, to, and to, to look at every woman that walked in front of me and to, and to seek out pornography. That would be my natural way to live. So it's only by God's Spirit and, and by His power that, that I am able to decide and to have the and to have my conscience uh, uh, pricked in such a way that I want to live differently and um, and God gives you that power and, and God changes he gives you new eyes to see with and a new a new a new mind to think with our, our minds and our hearts are transformed um, you're constantly uh, there, there's always that that lure there's always that call back into that other dark way of living. But God, God comes in and he, he shows you a different way uh, to live and to, to have peace and freedom and happiness and joy and true intimacy and fulfillment. Nowhere in the scriptures does the scriptures say that we are unlovable. And a lot of Christian approaches that are just uh, blanket Christian approaches actually end up shaming people and pushing people further into darkness. And so the starting point of where is Jesus? Jesus is this amazing, radical, unbelievable, relentless lover who loves at the expense of his own broken heart. And what that means is, in the center of God's heart, there's not shame when he thinks of me. When God thought of me in my darkest sexual moment, in my greatest moment of infidelity, Jesus was not shaming me. 
Jesus was there on the cross for me. Jesus had compassion. Jesus had this intense desire to say, this is what I'm going to do to set him free, to bind up his broken heart. And the amazing thing about the gospel is that God actually takes our failure, our sin, our shame, our wickedness, our wounds, and he transforms it. And that's what the cross is all about. The cross is not just about forgiveness. The cross is our entry into a life with God, a God who embraces us, a God who doesn't shame us, a God who wants us, even in our darkest moment, and then who wants to set us free to live out his passion, which is to bless the world, to live with a heart that's fully alive, to love. There's always hope, even in the worst of it. I had a ray of hope that God had to be greater than this. Or, or why bother? <laughs> uh, so I, I brought my nothing to Him. I felt like I had nothing left to give. I had no strength left. I had no self-respect left, I had no respect left with her. I just bring my nothing and I remember praying. Specifically, God, I'm bringing you my nothing. If you can do anything with my nothing and make a life out of it, I'll serve you the rest of my life. And I felt in response an impression from the Holy Spirit saying, John, all that is I made out of nothing. So today begins a whole new life for you. So in my case, he had to get me to the point where I was fully convinced I really have nothing to give you, even though I never really did. And when I really gave the nothing over and left it there and just cried out like David did and said, show me your ways. Show me how to live. Show me how to hide your word in my heart that I don't miss the mark that you set for me to live. God is strength and through the hard part of it was a gentle and loving reminder that even though this is hard that he's with me and and reminding me of my not of my own failure but that I don't have the right to hold on to things I don't have the right to stay angry and keep my resentment because I was wronged. Because if I do that, then I, I can't, I can't forgive and I, we can't walk in freedom together. At the moment where you feel like you've, you've just run out of all grace and mercy with God, where you are, you know, there's such shame and there's such um, guilt and, and ugliness to your life where you can't even stand yourself and you wonder if God could ever stand you. And it actually provides, it all actually gives you the reason to go back to pornography and you say, well, I'm already a mess anyway. I've gone this far. I may as well continue. Um, I think the message that always came back to me is, is, the, is the message that Paul received, that my grace is sufficient for you. That God's sufficiency, God's, God is big and God is enormous. And no matter how far down this dark tunnel I travel, I've never gone so far that God can't love me and he can't, he can't rescue me. I think it's important that we don't paint a, a uh, an unrealistic picture and try to hand somebody three easy steps to a happy life. You know, I, that's not what this is about. This is about transforming your perspective before God 
allowing him to give you an entirely new value structure that's not prominent in culture and and making his heart and his ways like David said show me your ways God that I can run the path you set for me you know men get so destroyed they can't even run anymore they're fumbling all over themselves and applauding each other's hey you know it's, you know, <laughs> it's tragic to me show me your ways so I can run uh, was the cry of my heart. That's, that's the freedom cry. 